Let us draw near with a true heart of faith. Now here in the book of Hebrews and in many other places throughout the New Testament, we read how we are to go on with God to higher levels of spiritual experience from glory to glory, from line upon line, grace upon grace, from our scripture in Psalm 84, strength upon strength, how we're to go on with God. But specifically, an area in the scriptures that tells us how to go on into further things in God is Moses' tabernacle. Moses built a tabernacle as a dwelling place for God, and this teaches us important truths. And most of us know the foundations to this, so we'll go through the foundations very quickly. Moses' tabernacle had three parts. Shown here, the large outer court, out in the sunlight, just surrounded by uh, a fence, basically. And then a tented building, the largest part, the first to enter into, was called the holy place. And then on the deep inside, the furthest place inward, the place where God's glory dwelt, was the holy of holies. <coughs> and these three sections teach us how we can press into God, how we can develop our own relationship with God in our own ministries. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Apostle Paul said, Do you not know that you are the dwelling place of God? That God dwells in you by His Spirit. And so we learn about our spiritual experience as Christians through the topology, the prophetic shadows of the Old Testament tabernacle of Moses. And as we learn how to spiritually enter in, to the holy place and from there step into the holy of holies we can learn to experience more and more of his grace grace upon grace of his power from strength to strength of his mercy as we come into the holy of holies before the mercy seat the the central focus and highest place in Moses's tabernacle now, when we look at the outer court, that was the large outer section of the tabernacle. And in that large outside area, just enclosed by curtain linen fence, all of the Israelites, all of God's people were welcome to go into the outer court. And there they could sacrifice to God, have the priests put their offering of sacrifice on the brazen laver or or they could, a brass altar, or they could, uh, the priest could go to the brazen laver and wash themselves. This was a place available to all of God's people. However, to go in to the holy place, only the sanctified, prepared priests were allowed in. And as Pastor Tim was teaching us, it was the tribe of Levi that was chosen by God to be the priests in the Old Testament. Originally, God's purpose in Exodus it says that they were all to be a kingdom of priests. But as they disqualified themselves with sin, God then later chose the tribe of Levi to specifically be the priests. In Exodus 32, as Pastor Tim was preaching the other night, and how when God's people went into idolatry and went astray, Moses came down with the word of the Lord. Who is on the Lord's side? And it was the tribe of Levi that responded to the call to fully follow God. And as a result, they were given the priesthood. So it's offered to all of God's people, but all of God's people don't always qualify. It's those that make a decision to fully follow the Lord. And then the priests to enter into the holy place... They also had to go through consecration, uh, 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 service and, and rituals of cleansing, of being sanctified by the blood. They had to have on the holy garments that would qualify them for the ministry in the holy place. And if we want to go into the holy place, we need to make a full decision to follow the Lord. 
to be consecrated to serve him. We need to have the garments of righteousness on and that which will prepare us that we are qualified to enter into the holy place. And if we fully dedicate our lives and we become those priests that enter into the holy place, there were three specific ministries that were performed in the holy place. Number one was the table of showbread. It was a table, if you've got good eyes, okay, a table there inside of the holy place upon which were placed 12 loaves of bread symbolizing each of the 12 tribes of Israel, but the bread spoke of their food. Even as Jesus said, I am the bread of life, the table of showbread was to symbolize how God would give his bread to all of his people. It was for every one of the tribes. Every Christian might, different tribes might have different loaves of bread. God will speak different things to different Christian groups. But there is food for all of God's people, as we heard in the prophecies this afternoon. Food that will equip us, that will strengthen and, and continue the work in each of our hearts according to where we are at and what our callings are. And in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, it speaks prophetically of the Lord Jesus, where he said prophetically, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I might give an answer to them who are weary. Morning by morning, he wakens my ear. Jesus had his daily morning devotions where the Father awakened his ear, where he heard the word of the Lord, where he gained his guidance for the day. He gained a fresh word every day for those that were weary. And in Revelation 2.17, we are told that he who overcomes, Jesus said, I will give of the hidden manna. The bread here in the holy place was hidden. It was placed inside the, the tented room. It couldn't be seen by all of God's people. It was brought forth by the priests, for the priests. And there is hidden manna. God wants to give each of us to strengthen us and make us those that will go with the strength of God's word for each of his people. And so that's available to us if we will enter into the holy place. There is the hidden manna. There is the fresh bread, the word of the Lord for all of God's people that we can obtain and distribute. Now, a second ministry that the priests had in the holy place was at the golden lampstand. The golden lampstand was a large candlestick. Uh, formed into seven uh, candles on top, seven lamps. And these seven lamps speak in the Bible in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, of the seven spirits of the Lord. Revelation 4, 5 says, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. So the priests in the holy place could enter in to this, which prophesied of the anointings of the seven spirits of God, the different anointings of the Holy Spirit that were upon our Lord Jesus himself, as was prophesied about him in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 where it says that a rod will come forth, a branch will come out of Jesse, Jesse who was the father of David, and Jesus is the son of David. It's prophesying of Jesus. And it says of him in Isaiah 11 too, and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. First anointing, spirit of the Lord. Then it says the spirit of wisdom, anointing two, and understanding, three. The spirit of counsel for and might. The spirit of knowledge. And number seven, the fear of the Lord. Seven different anointings of the Holy Spirit that will help us to accomplish the work of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord that we can preach with power. As it was declared in Isaiah 16, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to preach. There is the Spirit of counsel. 
that when there are difficulties in a person's life and we don't know which scriptural principle to apply, we don't know is this what they need to do or that, the spirit of counsel will cut through the fog, will dispel the mist, and will say, this is the way. Walk ye in it. If we have the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of might was upon Samson, and he did mighty works for God. But the spirit of might comes upon people in our days. Once when my wife was, if I could tell a story, she was 25 years old and we were preparing to come to the Philippines. We were staying temporarily in a small pastor's house. And she was having morning devotions, looking out a window when she saw a man walking by on the sidewalk. And the Lord gave her a word of knowledge and said, that man is a murderer and a rapist, you know. <laughs> now, that's not the kind of word of knowledge that, you know, you know blesses your heart, right? <laughs> and so she was reading her Bible, so she instantly turned away from that and went back to her Bible reading. But a very short time later, he was at the door opening it. It had not been locked, and she was the only one in this house. Everybody else was far away except for our little baby daughter in the next room. And this huge, strong man from a family, we later learned, just lived around the block where just about everyone in the family had been in prison for murder, rape, thievery. He came in the door. And as he came in, the Spirit of God came upon her. And what, 45 kilos? Okay, versus 100 kilos. <laughs> but with the Spirit of the Lord... She became a growling bear and lion. And she said, in the name of Jesus! And threw him out of the house. And then locked the door quick, okay? <laughs> the spirit of might is available today. And there are times when we grow weary in the battles. And we need the strength of God. We need to go from strength to strength. We need the spirit of might to turn back the hosts of darkness. And so there are all of these anointings available, the spirit of the fear of God, the fear of the Lord that can bring repentance, that can bring revival. So these are available to those in the holy place. But also, the third article of furniture, symbolizing the third ministry, place the bread on the table, they trimmed the candles, we need to, to always be uh, careful to let the anointing burn bright within our hearts. But then there was the altar of incense. And in the scriptures, incense speaks of our prayers. In Psalm 141, verse 2, let my prayer come before you as incense, David wrote. And in the book of Revelation, the incense was the prayer of the saints. And so God wants us to have ministries of power in prayer as intercessors, as those that will have power to prevail with God and man, as Jacob did when he became Israel and had the print and became a prince with authority. Now, this was in the holy place, but from the holy place, there was the deeper access to God, there was the most special room in Moses' tabernacle, the third place we looked at is called the Holy of Holies. But only one day in every year could only one man out of all of God's people enter the Holy of Holies. Okay, In the outer court, all of God's people were welcome. But in the holy place, only the sanctified priests qualified to enter into the holy place and experience the hidden manna and the anointings of the seven candlesticks and the incense of the prayers that would ascend to God. But into the holy of holies, the general priests were not allowed. Only the high priest was allowed. And even he could only enter one time a year, once a year, the high priest went in with incense to sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat. 
which you can study from Leviticus 16, verse 29 through 34, if you'd like, and Leviticus 23. And when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, this brought the forgiveness of sins for all of God's people. The entire nation of Israel, all of God's people, were cleansed on the Day of Atonement when the high priest went in to the Holy of Holies into the very presence and glory of God. Now, if you just very quickly want to compare some of the differences in these three sections. We have a chart, if you can see it, okay. And it shows the three parts of the tabernacle, outer court, holy place, holy of holies. Who can enter? The outer court, all of God's people. Who could enter the holy place? Only the priests, daily. Who could enter the holy of holies? Only the high priest, once a year. It was more selective. There were higher qualifications to get closer and closer to God. And what was the source of light in the outer court? It was outside. It was the natural light of the sun that lightened the outer court. And when we're in an outer court spiritual experience, the natural light of God leads us along in life. But if we enter into the covered tabernacle, into the holy place, there it was the candlesticks. It was the anointings of the Holy Spirit that gave light and guidance to those in the holy place. A brighter light, a more spiritual light. But in the Holy of Holies, there was no candlesticks, no natural light, no human light. It was illuminated by the light of God, the glory of God shining out from the mercy seat. And so there was a progression of more purified and more wonderful light as you went through these three sections. And you can also study in the outer court the power of the blood. A person would offer a sacrifice, and that sacrifice would forgive the sins of a person or of a family. Someone could come and bring a sacrifice for his family. In the outer court, the power of the blood brought cleansing to a person or family. That's wonderful. But in the holy place, the priests were cleansed by blood as part of their consecration. And the blood in the holy place enabled ministries of power to go forth with cleansing. A higher power to the blood. It cleanses the person in the old in the outer court. It cleanses the ministry in the holy place. But when the high priest on the day of atonement brought the blood closest to God, sprinkled on the mercy seat, the power of the blood cleansed a nation. The closer we get to God, and the closer to God, the higher in the heavenlies, we can apply the power of the blood. For us, the blood of Jesus. Then the closer we get to God, the more powerful the blood of Christ is to bring cleansing. Okay? So we see these things in Moses' tabernacle, and it shows us how important and how valuable it is that we press on past the outer court, past the crowds of people, past even the priests that sing God's praise and serve him in the holy place. But bring us in to the holy of holies should be our prayer and was one of the prophecies earlier today. Now, how can we draw near to God? How can we experience that power? The power of the blood that in the outer court Cleanses a person, a family? How can we go on to greater power and enter the holy place? How can we go on into the holy of holies? Let me just give you a few examples that will just help illustrate this a little bit. There was a time when uh, I was one of the pastors of a church, and one of the church members was going to rent uh, a new, a used house, but new place for them to live. And she called up and said, uh, Pastor Holmes, could you please... Uh, bring a prayer group over. We're renting a house, but it's an older house that people say is a haunted house. 
could you come over and cleanse the house? And I said, sure, that's fine. And so we went into the house, and the first room we were in, the hair on, the, on our arms and on the back of our neck, <laughs> yes, my maraming mga demonio. Okay? And we thought, oh, in this room, oh, there were spirits of drug abuse and, and, and things. And so what do we do? I prayed and felt, brought the guitar, started to sing. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood, in the blood of the land, of the land. Okay. <laughs> Time to do warfare, to bring cleansing to a family. And as we worshiped and proclaimed the power of the blood, the Holy Spirit came down and washed away the uncleanness, forgave and brought cleansing. The demons were cast out. And we said, oh, okay, mission accomplished in this room. We went then into a bedroom. And there were spirits of immorality in that room. And again, we felt to sing songs. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. And we worshiped until... That room was cleansed. In another room, until the whole house, the whole property was cleansed by the blood of Christ. And then we said, Sister Dawn, you and your family can live here. It's going to be a place of peace now. A few days after that, she told a very unusual story about her husband in their new house. Now, Sister Dawn was a godly Christian. Her children were following the Lord. The husband was a very different story. He was an alcoholic, he was immoral, and he was a professional gambler. Okay? But one day, just a few days after they started running the place, he was standing outside looking at his, you know, the house he was renting, the new rented house, just admiring it, looking around the grass, the property, when he heard on the other side of their fence, over in the neighbor's yard, a voice calling to him saying, come over here, come over here. And he looked. Okay, my tinig, pero walang tao. Okay, <laughs> there was nobody there. And the voices were saying, come over here, we want to go drink and gamble and have fun. Okay, and, and, and he could see there was no one there. And he's... Now, he was not a Christian, so he talked to his voices. When demons spoke to Jesus, he told them to shut up, okay? <laughs> So Christians shouldn't do this, but he wasn't a Christian. He didn't know the Bible. So he said, uh, wh why do you want me to go over there? Why don't you come over here? And the voices said, oh, we can't come over the fence onto your property. There's too much of the blood of Jesus over there. And when he left his house and walked out of the gate, he could get demon-possessed and go out and drink and party and gamble and do all these things. But when he would come home at night into the gate, to where the blood was, he had to leave his buddies behind. <laughs> they were not allowed. They were not comfortable. They couldn't get in. And so there, in the peace of God, in the presence of God in that house, within a few weeks, he was born again. God worked in his life too. And the blood had the power to cleanse and protect a family. As we sang to the walls and, and the corners, and I think there might be a demon over there. Power in the blood, okay? And, and just conducted warfare on a lower level, the level of a house. But I can also remember a time when I was invited to preach at a church. And this church, some years before, had been a very powerful, good church, hundreds of members, uh, a church really known for the power of God and soul winning and a strong youth group. But when I was invited to go there, was years after their time of revival and glory, when, because the pastor had been disobedient, he should have resigned the church, given it to someone younger. He was getting elderly and could no longer properly function in his ministry. But because he needed the ties and he needed the security of living in the pastor's house, he kept his pastorate after God wanted him to retire. And so the church went downhill, and the young people left. The pastor left, uh, couldn't stay in touch with all the people as well anymore. And finally, when I was invited to preach there, the church had six members, Lolos and Lolas. It was a, a grandparents' club, okay? <laughs> it wasn't a church. Uh, it wasn't the army of God on earth. 
It was just a bunch of old folks just waiting to die and go to heaven, okay? <laughs> just hang, it, hang on till Jesus comes for you, okay? No victory, defeat, discouragement in the church. And so the, my first response was, do I want to preach in that church? You know, but I prayed and felt it was God. So we stayed there the night before at, you know, on the church property. And as I was praying, God showed me in the heavenlies above the church a central throne, some distance above the church, maybe, uh, maybe 100 meters up in the air. It would be only a guess. And on that throne was sitting a fallen angel. Now, this was a Pentecostal church, preached the pastor, and because almost all the people had left, they had come into discouragement, failure, and it was no longer the power of God moving. There was a fallen angel sitting on the central throne over that church, controlling and oppressing the church. Now, the Bible does say in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, to the angel of the church of... That angel could be interpreted two ways, according to the Greek, heavenly angel or earthly messenger. It could be speaking of the pastor, but it can also be speaking of the angels. There should be a guardian angel over every church, just as there is over every life. But because of the disobedience of this pastor, it was no longer a holy angel sitting on the throne guarding that church. It was a fallen angel oppressing and stopping the church from being effective. And when I saw that, I said, Lord, what do I do? And I felt to start singing about the power of the blood of Jesus. And as I began to sing, I saw the vision repeated and repeated, but it started to change. There was still the fallen angel high above the church on his throne, controlling and oppressing the church. But then I saw as I sang about the blood of Jesus that a fountain began springing up from the foundations, from the ground, springing up into the church. And the more that I exalted the power of the blood, the higher the fountain sprang up. Now in Zechariah chapter 13, I think, and verse 1 it says, In that day a fountain will be opened for sin and uncleanness. And in a similar way I saw a fountain, not of water, but a fountain of the blood of Jesus Christ spring up. And as they got higher and higher into the heavenlies, it was washing away the sin of the church. And as I continued on for a half hour, about an hour, and just exalted the power, the victory of the blood, it was rising higher and higher. And as it got close to the throne that fallen angel was on, he was looking down. He was getting very, very nervous. And just before the blood of Jesus arose in the heavenlies up to the throne, he ran away in terror. He could not stay there with the blood of Jesus coming to cleanse and wash away all of the sin of the church up to the highest place. And as he fled in terror and the sin was washed away, a new angel came to sit upon the throne. And he was a holy angel of God. So after finishing that spiritual warfare, I was ready to preach the next morning. And when, and yes, there was only six Lolos and Lolas. The grandparents' club was, was in full force, all six of them. Okay. <laughs> But the difference was in the heavenlies over that church, there was cleansing, there was freedom, there was anointing, there was power, and the Spirit of God moved in that church. And after the church, they all gathered together like in a huddle, and they all started talking and saying, oh, that was wonderful, oh, that was great. And so one of them said, oh, this is like it used to be in the days of revival. And, and they're all talking about how, you know, it's been years since the Spirit of God moved like that. And I listened to what the pastor was saying. He was talking to himself kind of there in the group. And he was saying, we haven't had the Spirit of God move like that in so many years. And he said to himself, I I'm getting too old. I can't do this kind of thing like, like this young man. I was young back then, okay? Uh, <laughs> past tense, okay. I joined the Senior Citizen Club last October, okay? <laughs> So when I need to get in grocery line fast, I just kind of hobble over there, you know, and get the quick line in the grocery store now. Okay. 
But he said, I, I can't, I'm too old for this kind of thing. He said, I, I should resign. We should get a young pastor in here. And I wanted, I just wanted to say, hey, man, that's right. Okay, but the Spirit of God was speaking, so I didn't have to. And the result of it was a few weeks later, he started searching for a pastor, young pastor, to take his place. There was a man prepared by God. He resigned. The new pastor moved in one year after I had been there. And there was a transition in the heavenlies. One year later, they had their new pastor. The church was going forth in renewed power. They had about 100 people attending the church. There were young people. And the church was going back into becoming a powerhouse for God. Because there is power when we bring the blood into the heavenlies. Not, you know, up in the stars and moon. No, just about maybe 100 meters above the church, just cleansing the church. If the blood is on earth, it can cleanse a heart. If the blood is upon a house, it can cleanse a family. If the blood is higher, it can cleanse a church. If it's higher, it can cleanse a city or a town. I could tell you a lot of stories, but we don't have time. But I'll tell you some stories later. When you get into the Holy of Holies, the blood can cleanse a nation. So how do we get in? How do we press into this? First of all, we must be hidden in Christ, our high priest. We already mentioned only the high priest was allowed into the Holy of Holies. And so who is our high priest? We're to be priests to God. But the book of Hebrews also tells us very clearly that for us New Testament Christians, it is our Lord Jesus who is our great high priest, whoever lives to make intercession for us. And in Hebrews 9, verse 11 and 12, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands of this creation and not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal salvation. Jesus entered the true holy of holies when he had conquered death and hell and ascended to heaven to the right hand of the Father. He came with the blood that brought eternal salvation for whosoever will believe, for all of God's people, that we can be a holy nation cleansed by the blood brought into the true holy of holies in heaven. So... If he's the high priest, how do we get into the Holy of Holies? We must be hidden with Christ in God. And so we're taught all through the New Testament how we are to learn how to have our life conformed to the image of Christ. How we are to be formed into his image and likeness. And in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 2, we can read. In Colossians 3 and verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are, have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. If we set our affections on the things above, we can know we are dead and our life is hidden with Christ in God. Last night, I think it was, Pastor Tim was speaking from Romans 6.6 6 about how we are to be crucified with Christ. We are to live the crucified life, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ, that we are not under the power of the law. That doesn't mean we don't, that we disobey it. It means it's fulfilled in those that have the laws written on our hearts and minds. It's fulfilled by those who have come into the image of Christ. It was prophesied of Christ. Behold, it's written in the volume of the book. I come to do thy will, O God. I delight to do your will. And your law is written in my heart. And if we'll let the volume of the book from Genesis to Revelation be imparted within us that the word will be made flesh, we will have the same heart's cry. I have come, Lord, to do your will. Your law is written on my heart even as the law was hidden inside the Holy of Holies. Moses' Ten Commandments 
were placed in the Ark of, Co uh, the, Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies. It was not thrown away. It was fulfilled and will be fulfilled by us who are hidden with Christ in God. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul declared, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. We can hinder the grace of God and be carnal Christians. We can stay in the outer court. But if we desire to draw nearer to God, if we say, Lord, we don't want to just be content with a little blessing. We don't want to be Laodicean Christians that have a little of God and that's enough. But if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, if we want more of God, if we know not only we need more of God, this sinful world needs more of God, needs to see the people of God arising in the nature and the character and the power of God, then we will not frustrate God's grace. Paul said, the grace of God, which works mightily in me, made me do more than all the other apostles. Do we let the grace of God work mightily in our lives? Or do we make wrong choices to limit God? Well, I don't have to pray every day. You know, there's a PBA game on TV, and, and my, you know, Pure Foods, my favorite team is playing. <gasps> okay? We make choices every day what we do with our life. May we make the choices of those that flow in the river of God's grace, that no longer live for our own selfish desires, our own carnal motivations, but that we are crucified with Christ. And it is Christ who lives in us that it will be the Son of God arising in our lives with healing, with power, with glory to reach out into this world that we will be his hand extended. When? When we're hidden with Christ in God. And we can enter the Holy of Holies to enter into the full power and glory and full purposes of God. Now, when the high priest went in to the Holy of Holies, there were three things needed. Number one, he went in after incense had filled on the Day of Atonement, and as we mentioned, incense speaks of our prayer. We need to have lives of prayer and intercession that prepare the way for the holy place, the Holy of Holies, to be open to us. And then the high priest came with the blood of the sacrifice for us, the blood of Jesus. The high priest placed it on the mercy seat, on the central focus of the Holy of Holies. There at the Ark of God, where in the center of it, there is a place to put the blood that it would atone for the sins of all of God's people. And from the mercy seat, the Bible says, God shined forth his glory. From the mercy seat, God spoke from the mercy seat. God moved and revealed his power from the mercy seat where the blood was applied in the Holy of Holies. And then a third very important key was the high priest could only enter on the Day of Atonement, one day a year, the day that God had ordained for mercy and cleansing for all of God's people. And if you study this well in the Bible or if you come to Bible school, okay, the Day of Atonement was near the end of the Jewish agricultural year. At the end of the calendar, there was... Uh, right at the time of, of all the harvest, it started with the Day of Atonement, cleansing, the day the Jews were to fast, a day when the blood was to be brought into the Holy of Holies to bring cleansing to all of God's people. But while this was done at the end of the year for the Jewish people, prophetically it speaks of how God is going to do this at the end of the church age. 
because there are three different places in the scriptures that speak about the church age being like a year in Israel. James 5, 7 says, before the second coming of Christ, he will be patient like a farmer waiting for the early and the latter rain. And after the later rain, when the harvest is ready, then Jesus will come back in his second coming. But it's speaking of the time right after the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, or in gathering, the Feast of Harvest. This was the beginning of the last feast in the Jewish year, and it is the beginning, the Day of Atonement is the beginning of what will be the Feast of Harvest, will be the last great revivals around the world that will gather in the full harvest and the gospel will be preached in all the world. And then Jesus will return for his completed church, for his prepared bride. And so we can't look at the other reasons, but the Day of Atonement was at the end of the year. And for us, it's near the end of the church age. Now, when we are alive, when the gospel is spreading throughout the world, when we are near the return of Jesus Christ, this is a time for the day of atonement for God's people. And if we're hidden with Christ in God, it's no longer us living our lives and doing our own thing, but we're hidden in Christ, entering in through the holy place, into the holy of holies, with intercession, with the blood of Jesus. On the day of atonement, there will be cleansing for the nations and as the world grows more spiritually dark and sinful in our days God's people need to press into the holy of holies in Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 through 3 it says behold darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the nations but the Lord will arise upon you his glory will be seen upon you and nations will come to the brightness of your rising when will the nations turn to Christ? It's when the glory of God arises on the church. And when will the glory of God arise? It's when the world gets into deeper and deeper darkness. And you don't have to read very many newspapers or hear very many reports to know the world is getting darker. The morals of the world are becoming more and more corrupt. In most of the nations of the world now, homosexuality is, is promoted. And even some churches, God forbid, are saying, oh, it's okay. Laws and nations are changing. You can smoke marijuana. It's okay. It's legal. Laws are being changed, as Pastor Tim had mentioned. The world is growing darker. There's more wars and rumors of wars. There's more trouble among the nations. The world is growing darker and so it is time the church needs to grow brighter to be the answer, to be the lighthouse, to be the light of salvation to the ends of the earth. About four years ago, right when the nation of Tunisia started to get, to get into trouble, it was, we didn't know it yet, it was the beginning of what was called the Arab Spring. Tunisia was the first Muslim nation to uh, experience a government uh, turnover, uh, in, uh, and from that, Egypt had a revolution, Libya, Syria, many, many nations among the Islamic world. But right at the very beginning, before it was a general thing, just one nation, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I am beginning to shake the Islamic nations of the world, and I will prove to the world that Islam does not have the answers for the problems of the world. Now back in the 19, late 1980s, God proved to the world communism doesn't have the answers to the world's problems. For decades they said, we are the ones that will make the world good, and they ended up worse than all the rest. And most of the nations of the world turned away from communism. That became discredited when God shook the communist nations. But Four years ago, God said, now I'm going to start shaking the Islamic nations. And that's in line with the prophecy of Haggai chapter 2 that said, oh, before the second coming of Christ, yet once a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Repeated in Hebrews 12, 
that God was going to shake the nations in these last days to show ever to let the things of this world collapse that only the kingdom of Christ would remain secure Amen. and be seen. And so communism is discredited. People are saying, what are the answers to the problems of the world? Anyone who knows anything about present world history knows Islam does not have the answers for the world's problems. They are among the most troubled, most unbalanced, most oppressive nations in the world. As God shakes them, the cracks and the governments fall. So we don't mind hearing that. Good God, give it to him, okay? Show the world Islam doesn't have the answers. But right after that, God spoke to me a second time. And he said, after I have shaken the Islamic nations of the world, I will shake the democracies of the world and show the world that democracy does not have the answers for the world's problems. Democracies have a lot of good about them, but it's built on man, not on the kingdom of God. And democracy only works in a nation that has godly foundations, Christian foundations. If a nation is divided into different people groups and different groups, then democracies, they fight each other instead of working together. And we're going to see more and more the democracies of this world failing, not able to settle their problems, arguing, fighting, wars, rumors of wars, economic collapses, as democracies cannot handle their problems. Changes of government, change after change after change, because democracy does not have the answers for the world's problems. The answer for the world's problems is the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And so God is going to open the eyes of people, and they'll say, the answer isn't here, the answer isn't there, the answer isn't there, where is the answer? And this is when we must arise and shine. And Jesus to cleanse the church. But when the blood of Jesus is brought to the Holy of Holies, the blood of Jesus has the power to cleanse the nations. And that is what, why we need to press in in these days. The closer we approach to God, the more power, glory, and revival will be released. And we can see in Old Testament prophetic picture of this in the life of Queen Esther. She, in a time when God's people were all facing great trouble and calamity, she entered, uninvited, into the king's throne room. And no one was permitted into the king's throne room without an invitation, or they died, unless the king extended his scepter. And if the person touched the scepter, mercy was given to the uninvited person. And so Queen Esther, knowing that, her, that all of God's people were going to die if she didn't intercede, if she didn't come before the throne, she risked her life. If I perish, I perish. She went into the throne room, symbolizing for us a Christian pressing into God, into the throne room of God, the Holy of Holies. And there, when we come before God in all of his power and glory and holiness, Will we die? No flesh can see him and live. Will we die if we press in to God? Well, the Bible says, having boldness to enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. Let us draw near with the true heart of faith. Let us believe that God is inviting us into something greater from strength to strength. From outer court to holy place, to the holy of holies. From power to help a, a, a person or a family, to our power to cleanse the ministry and cleanse churches and cities and nations. Back in 1974, I was a young Bible school student, and there was a calamity, a great disaster that was coming to my home nation. There was a amendment to the U.S. Constitution called the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment. And this was to give equal rights between men and women, but it was a bill crafted in a very unbalanced way so that if this was made, national law was put in the Constitution as the foundation of American society, 
America would have unisex bathrooms. Men and women would go to the same bathroom. And a lot of corruption this law would have brought. And so, according to U.S. constitutional law, if two-thirds of the states, each in an individual vote, vote yes to amend the U.S. Constitution, when two-thirds vote yes, then it automatically becomes American law, put in the f solid foundation of the U.S. Constitution. So there are 22 or 23 amendments in the last 230 years to the U.S. Constitution. And this would have been another one. Well, at this time, they needed 32 votes yes, 31 states had voted for the ERA that would have brought homosexuality, unisex, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, any sexual, every crazy thing, fully legal in America. 31 had voted yes. Now, New York State, where I was living, where I was a Bible school student, the day came when the next day they were going to hold the vote, whether this would be legalized. And if New York voted yes, it would be automatically American law. And all the other states had voted yes. And New York State was known to be much more liberal than many of the other states that voted yes. The not so liberal states voted yes, so everybody knew New York State was going to vote yes. And this would be national law in America. But the night before the vote, I was at Bible school. And I remember how the Spirit of God came down upon me, came down upon others. I'm sure there were intercessors all through New York State and America. The burden of the Lord came upon us. And we wept, we groaned, we said, Lord, have mercy, have mercy on the nation. And we came before the mercy seat of God. The next day, to everyone's shock, New York State voted no. But the people that were promoting the women's lib, equal rights, everything, said, it's no problem. No, there's 17 more states. That's no problem. We got 31. We only need one more. The next state voted no. The next state voted no. The next state, no, 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 no. And right at the edge of disaster, the Spirit of God moved upon the intercessors like Queen Esther to come before, not the natural throne, but the throne of mercy and grace. Lord, spare your people from this evil law. Rescue us, God. And there was a national deliverance by the Esthers that pressed into the Holy of Holies. Back a hundred years ago, there was a coal miner who lived in the western area of the United Kingdom. It was the nation of Wales. This coal miner had worked in the coal mine since he was a young teenager. Didn't even get a proper schooling because the family was poor. And as when he was 14 years old, he had to start working in the coal mines. Worked many, many years. But he was a godly Christian that had a real burden in his heart. And he prayed constantly for his beloved nation. He prayed so much that when he was a young man that moved out of his house, he was 18 or 19, he rented an apartment in a boarding house, one room out of many rooms. And he prayed, oh, Lord, save Wales, bring revival. He prayed with such a burden that his landlady asked him to move out. <laughs> he said, you're too noisy when you pray. You're scaring everybody. You, 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 you can't stay here. But he had that burden in his heart that carried on and on and on. And eventually, when he was 24 years old, the burden became so great that he entered into the Holy of Holies. And it's written in history. Let me read to you. One day in the spring of 1904, 24-year-old Evan Roberts found himself in an experience he later called a Mount of Transfiguration experience. He was lifted up into the heavenlies. Let's call it today the Holy of Holies, okay? The Lord revealed himself to young Evans in such an amazing and overwhelming manner that Evans was filled with divine awe and glory. After this, he went through uncontrollable trembling that made his family very concerned. For days, he walked around. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And 
his family said, what's, what's wrong with you? And he said, I am meeting with God. God is revealing himself. What's it like? And he said, it's indescribable. I can't explain the glory of God. And finally the day came when the Spirit of God fell upon him and gave him a vision. And at that time, he was going to a Bible school. And his roommate came in about midnight and saw that shining from Evan's face was visible light and glory. And his roommate, Sidney, said, what happened to you? And Evan said, I have just seen a vision of all of our nation being lifted up to heaven. We're going to see the greatest revival Wales has ever seen. And the Holy Spirit is coming now. And then he said to his roommate, Evans, do you believe God can give us 100,000 souls right now? And the power of God was so strong that even his roommate said, I believe. <laughs> now, I don't tell this story in Bible school very often because what happened next was God told him to go back to his home church and preach to the young people. And he, had, he hadn't graduated, you know, so I don't tell this story to the Bible school <laughs> students, okay? But he was led by God. He took the train trip back home. He, he saw his mom, and she said, What's wrong? Why aren't you at school? Are you sick? And he said, No, Mom. God brought me back here to preach to the young people in the church. He went to his pastor and, and asked permission to hold services for the young people. His pastor greeted young Evans with open skepticism. Didn't really believe it. He was not allowed to preach that Sunday. Instead, he was invited to attend the Monday night prayer meeting, but even at the prayer meeting, he was not allowed to speak. It was after the pastor closed the prayer service, then he said, uh, Evan Robbins has, Roberts has come home from uh, Bible school, and he says that he has something you know, that he wants to share with us. If anyone wants to stay, prayer service is over. If you want to stay, let's, let's hear what he has to say. 17 people stayed, and as he spoke, the conviction of the Holy Spirit was there. And they had a three-hour prayer meeting calling on God for revival. So the end of the prayer meeting became the beginning of the prayer meeting, okay? <laughs> and the pastor noticed, oh, yes, he, he has something, a message from God. And so he said, uh, at the end of that, he said, folks, uh, we'll have another service tomorrow night. It's not scheduled, but... Uh, we'll let young Evan speak. If anyone wants to come, you're, you know, the church will be open. He can speak again. And more people came on Tuesday night. Wednesday night, they let another service. He spoke, and the power of God fell. And the people started weeping and mourning and, and lamenting and crying out to God for revival. By Friday, people were coming from out of town to hear the young coal miner preach. By the following Monday, one week after he started preaching, that whole area of the nation was being shaken. People were waking up in the villages early in the morning to hear the roar of great crowds of thousands of people that got up and went to the churches to cry out to God in repentance and praying for revival. Two weeks after he started preaching, the national press wrote their first article. And it was, the reporter wrote, a remarkable religious revival has started in the town of Lahore. This place has been besieged by dense crowds of people coming. There is so much excitement everywhere that the road into town is filled with people from one end to the other and walking into town to come to the revival services at night. And within a few weeks, Evan Roberts gathered a small team of teenagers and young people, all like him, under the age of 25. And they went from town to town, testifying, preaching, revival fires. And within a few months, all of the nation was being shaken by God. The presence of God was revealed everywhere in the nation. Sinners would go to the pubs to get drunk, and they would take a glass of alcohol, and before they would bring it to their mouth, the Spirit of God would fall on them, 
And they'd put the glasses down. They'd fall on the ground. And they would crawl to the nearest church to repent. It was reported. The drinking saloons and the houses of prostitution became empty through the whole nation. The dance halls, the movie theaters, and even the national pastime, the football games were unattended. Nobody went to any of those things anymore. But the foot, their national football team didn't mind because they had gotten all saved and they were going to the churches sharing their testimony. <laughs> Everybody was going to church. All the churches of the nation, everywhere around, thousands of people. You couldn't get in, then you'd stand at the windows. And, 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 and there was revival on the outside as well. The courts had nothing to do. There was no more lawlessness. The police didn't have any normal duties. No one to arrest, no people causing trouble. They had to change their duties. They became the traffic policemen because of the thousands of people coming to the churches every night. In one, uh, one town, the, the police closed down because uh, they had formed a singing choir, all the policemen, and so they left their town, they didn't need policemen, and they traveled from town to town, and they sang as a policeman singing quartet, singing at all of the revi at different revival services traveling around. Within one year, over 100,000 souls were added to the churches. Hundreds of thousands got saved, but more than 100,000 had listed their names. I am a new member. I am born again. And the revival of Wales was moving onward with power. When? When a young man with just a little bit of training, not a, even a formal education, not even a high school diploma, pressed into God, into the Holy of Holies, to the mercy seat, so that there was cleansing for his nation. A little less than 500 years ago, in the nation of Scotland, the whole nation was Catholic. And there were a few people that had heard the preaching of Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation, back to the Bible. And there was one man that began to preach the gospel in Scotland. And one of his new converts, his name was John Knox. And John Knox formed, became one of the followers of this preacher. And, but very shortly, the preacher was arrested by the Catholics. He was burned at the stake. And his followers, including John Knox, were locked up as slaves. And for years, John Knox was chained to a boat, and he had to row it as a slave for having become a born-again Christian in a Catholic nation. But in that suffering and affliction, with every row of the boat, he made it a prayer. Lord, save Scotland. Lord, save Scotland. Lord, Release me and let me preach. Lord, bring your gospel to my nation. After several years, he remarkably, he didn't die. Most died very quick in that situation. He didn't die, and by some miracle, he was released. And he went back to his hometown, began to preach, and revival started. Traveled around the nation, starting revivals. There were others that were coming into the born-again experience. But it wasn't the preaching that was the most effective thing. It was their prayer lives. They prayed four hours, six hours a day, these holy men of God. They prayed until they heard from God, until they prophesied judgments upon their enemies. There was one uh, police chief that had arrested uh, 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 a born-again preacher. And they prophesied, within six months, you're going to be hanged. And within six months, he did something, and he was hung and killed. They entered in to the authority of God through their prayer lives. And John Knox had one prayer. He prayed more than everything else. Prayed sometimes hours a day. A very simple prayer. He said, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. Give me Scotland or I die. And as the revival went on through the prayers of those revivalists, the Catholic Queen, Queen Mary of Scotland, she was a very wicked, immoral ruler. She said, she said, there's one thing I fear more than the armies of England. Because if you know your geography, England is the southern part of the island and Scotland is the northern part. She said, there's one thing I fear more than the armies of England. She said, it is the prayers 
of John Knox. What was his prayer? Lord, give me Scotland or I die. When my wife was a teenager and ministering in Scotland, she was taken with reverence to the birth house, the birthing, birthplace of John Knox, their great national hero. The man who brought revival to Scotland and changed it from being a Catholic nation to being a Protestant nation from whose doctrines everyone could be born again. And there in that house, there was on a wall display in a brass plaque, the prayer of John Knox. Hundreds of years, 500 years later. Lord, give me Scotland or I die. He entered into the Holy of Holies. He came before the mercy seat. He brought the blood for his nation. And God gave him the nation of Scotland. Now these are from history. Wales had revival 100 years ago. Scotland turned to Christ 400, 450 years ago. Who is going to press in in our days? Who is going to let their life be hid with Christ in God? Who is going to have the burden to pray through and enter into the Holy of Holies? Who is going to bring revival to Manila, to Kabanatuan, to Ifugao? Who's going to bring revival to Vietnam? Who's going to bring revival to Thailand? Who is going to press in to the Holy of Holies in these last days? It will happen. The gospel will go forward with power through the world. Nations shall turn to the Lord in that day was prophesied in the minor prophets. Nations will turn to the Lord. It's happened in the past. It's, but we heard the prophecy, Pastor Danny, but greater things are yet to come. And we need to get ready and press in. In closing, how much are we going to press in? Are we going to be content with being outer court Christians? Or is it just enough to have a fresh word from the Lord and the anointings of the holy place? Or are we going to go full on with God? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We read in Hebrews 11:6 With boldness. We can enter the Holy of Holies, the heavenly throne of God by the blood of Jesus. And it's time for us to enter in. The prophecy of Pastora Oz. It's time to enter the Holy of Holies. Last October, the Lord Jesus appeared to me. And he said the words, it's time for a new garment. He said to me, it is time for a new garment. Now, I was not, I did not have the filthy garments. I didn't need, you know, cleansing. Uh, but he wanted to give me new garments. And as he said that to me, he beckoned for me to follow him. And I followed him through the outer court, like the outer court of Moses' tabernacle. It was an outer courtyard filled with hundreds of people. And as I looked at them, I could tell most of them were preachers. And as we walked through this outer courtyard, he was leading me on to the garments he wanted to give me. And he, we walked past one section that had a lot of garments that were what we could call all-weather, waterproof, rainproof, snowproof coats. Okay? And if somebody wore this garment, this all-weather uh, mantle, then I knew they would be victorious through every storm, through every season of life. What a wonderful garment to have victory in every season of life, through your rain, through hot sunshine, to have a garment that keeps you protected and there's a victory in your life. But this was in the outer court. And the Lord was saying, come in further, follow me. And so we walked on further into the outer court, into a place where there was another section of garments. And these garments were all finely tailored, very beautiful, expensive suits. Suit coats and pants, like uh, from the finest tailors in, in the nations. And it was impressed on my heart. Anyone that had this kind of garment, wore this kind of garment, this kind of suit coat, would be welcome and appreciated in the biggest pulpits in the best churches in the world. If you were wearing this type of garment, 
you not only have victory in life, this kind of garment would welcome you into the biggest pulpits of the world. But this type of garment was still in the outer court. And as the Lord was walking past these, it was the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, you are to go on into the holy place. You are to go on to where the valuable garments are. And I would have thought the ones in the outer court were very valuable. But the Holy Spirit said, no, you go on to where the valuable garments are, into the Holy of Holies. Now, I have not shared this with many people because I wanted to experience it before I preach it. My wife and I have been fasting like we haven't in decades. We're seeking to press in in God. I have seen glimpses of this garment, but very honestly, I have not yet obtained it. But I know this is a time in God to press in. And I want to invite you to join with me. This is a season in God. We heard the prophecy, come into the Holy of Holies. God has done great things in the past and present. He's got greater things. It's time for us to come into the image and likeness of Christ. And as we're hidden in Christ the high priest, and we press in to the Holy of Holies, to the mercy seat, there will be the power of God released so that nations will come to the brightness of his rising, that there will be ministries of power that will make an impact that will help change the world and prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. Do we want this? Amen. Will we pay the price? Will we dedicate our lives? These are creation. So could you please rise with me? Let us pray. Lord, seal this within my heart. Lord, don't let me be content in the outer court. Don't let me be content with just a great blessing. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard the great things that God has waiting for those that love him. God has much greater things in these last days. Let's each lift up our voice and pray.